Hmm. All right. Uh, now we're going to hear from uh, Jim Al-Khalili, who is a distinguished professor of uh, physics up at uh, the University of Surrey. And he is also um, uh, involved with the uh, Lever, Lever Ulm uh, uh, Doctoral Training Center for Quantum Biology. Uh, so Jim is an expert in the, the field of quantum biology, and we're going to be hearing uh, his talk today on the quantum measurement problem uh, in the cellular environment. Thanks, Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you can all hear me fine. Um, so again, apologies for not being with you. It's, uh, it was a disappointment. Uh, as Travis mentioned, I was, I was on my way to the airport when BA cancelled my flight and so I panicked, looked around to see what other flights were available. There didn't seem to be anything. Yes, this was yesterday um, afternoon. Where are we now? Monday? No, uh, Sunday. Sunday afternoon. Um, anyway, uh, here I am. Hopefully, uh, th this, this should be okay, and I will share the screen with you now to show you my presentation. Okay, good, excellent. Um, so it might seem strange. So I'm I'm a quantum physicist uh, giving a talk at a, a, a conference on the nature of consciousness uh, in a session on uh, quantum origins of consciousness without really touching on consciousness itself um uh, and i'll explain uh, the, the reason why but I, I think the first thing to clarify is that when it comes to quantum origins of consciousness uh, as you as you're hearing in, in 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 this session um many people will will dismiss it but i believe for the wrong reasons uh yeah physicists will say no way can quantum effects quantum coherence last long enough to have a functional role uh, decoherence takes place quantum mechanics can't play a role in living systems uh, biologists neuroscientists computer scientists may dismiss it simply because they don't have a background in quantum mechanics now i'm i'm not an advocate of theories of quantum consciousness uh, but i also think the, the sort of arguments that you know well consciousness is mysterious quantum mechanics is mysterious doesn't mean the two are connected those sorts of arguments don't preclude the fact that, that maybe they are connected. Uh, uh, I, I, the, the new um, field of quantum biology is more to do with learning to walk before we can run, to try and understand whether quantum phenomena, quantum mechanisms play a functional role inside living organisms um, uh, and to find the experimental evidence for that in the hope that maybe one day some of these theories of quantum consciousness uh, will certainly be taken much more seriously, more widely uh, than they are uh, at the moment. So I want to talk in general about uh, quantum effects in, in, in biology. Um, I'm based at the University of Surrey uh, uh, in, uh, in Guildford, which is sort of halfway between London and the south coast of England. Uh, and um, together with my colleague, John Joe McFadden, who's, uh, I assume, unless he's overslept, he's in the audience uh, today, um, John Joe is a molecular geneticist. Uh, he and I got interested in, in looking at quantum effects in biology many, many years ago. Uh, recently, as was mentioned in the introduction, uh, we received funding from uh, um, the charity, the Leverhulm Trust, to uh, support uh, and, and create the first doctoral training center in quantum biology. Sorry, so here, these lovely people uh, in the photograph are some of our grad students in that first cohort uh, that got funded. Um, so I want to give a talk, I guess th this talk, and I've got uh, 30 minutes and I've already used about three and a half minutes of that. I want to try and stick to time. Uh, a talk in three chapters. The first chapter is really some history, the background to where quantum biology came from. Um, there were two reasons for an early interest in this field in the early decades of the 20th century. There was the obvious one that um, quantum mechanics developed in the 1920s was solving many problems in physics and chemistry. Uh, uh, the less obvious one is the rise of uh, organicism. Essentially, turn of the century, there were probably two schools of thought in terms of the, the meaning of life. There was reductionism, uh, that you can break everything down to its fundamental pieces. This is a very simplistic uh, definition of reduction, reductionism, so forgive me. Um, and that, you know, by breaking it up into some of its parts, that can tell you the whole. 
then there was vitalism, which is sort of a, a mystical idea that somehow there was a, a, a something other beyond science, uh, the spark of life that could explain life. And in between was this this notion of organicism, which essentially says that, yes, there is something different about life. There is some distinction uh, between um, animate and inanimate, inanimate matter that can be explained by laws of physics and chemistry, but maybe laws that we have yet to figure out and understand fully. One of the uh, the founders of, of some of these ideas was Ludwig van uh, von Bertalanffy, uh, the father of general systems theory, which I guess evolved in you know in the twenty early twenty first century into systems biology. Um, he wrote a book um, called the Critical Theory of Morphogenesis. His his notion idea was that biology was stagnating. I mean, bear in mind this is just a few years before the the big explosion in, in, in genetics and molecular biology in the 1930s. Nevertheless, he argued that uh, biology was stagnating, that new principles were needed to describe life. That may not have gone anywhere were it not for, I guess, the arrogance of quantum physicists in the 1920s. Certainly Niels Bohr in the, in the 1920s um, inspired a number of other physicists, uh, most notably people like Max Delbruck, who started off as a nuclear physicist, then moved into molecular biology, and um, others like Pascal Jordan, who was uh, uh, th then during the Second World War was uh, came out as a, as a Nazi, as a fascist, and, and uh, uh, was very much a lot of his work and his ideas were shunned uh, for that reason. Um, Niels Bohr, in 1929, gave a talk at a, at a, a conference uh, where he suggested this, he says, before I conclude, it would be natural at such a joint meeting of natural scientists to touch upon the question as to what light can be thrown upon the problems regarding living organisms by the latest developments of our knowledge of atomic phenomena, by which he means quantum mechanics. So he was sort of just throwing it out there that quantum mechanics may somehow play a role in life. Others took that on board and and wanted to see if there was some sort of quantum origin. They didn't really go very far. Most notably probably was um, Erwin Schrodinger's book, What is Life?, which he published in the mid-1940s. The basic idea in his book, the basic thesis, is that living organisms or, or, or the mechanisms inside living cells uh, behave in a way similar to the behavior of, of inanimate matter of equivalent complexity down near absolute zero. You, 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 certain materials, you, you, you cool them down to fractions of a, of, of a degree Kelvin or, or a few degrees Kelvin, and they will exhibit quantum phenomena like superconductivity, superfluidity, and so on. So Schrodinger was saying the, the order, the structure of living matter is, is, is similar to inanimate matter once you've calmed down the thermodynamic chaos. Um, again, it was a rather hand-wavy idea. He, he was talking about aperiodic crystals and so on, and certainly his book influenced many people, in particular Crick and Watson. Um, but it was based on quantum mechanics. This is my favorite cartoon uh, uh, depicting the, the counterintuitiveness of quantum mechanics. The quantum skier, you see the, the ski marks going around on either side of the tree, and yet the tree looks intact, and there's no reason to believe the skier couldn't father children. Um, and yet this is what happens in the quantum world. Physicists and chemists have, have had to uh, deal with this and, and reconcile themselves with the idea that, that quantum mechanics is indeed uh, mysterious. Can that mystery play a role inside living systems? Can the macroscopic world of life, uh, the same as the macroscopic world of steam engines and, and, and cannons and airplanes and so on, um, does life behave somehow differently? Is it able to reach down beyond the, the chaotic uh, world of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics uh, down to the, to the, the, the structure of, of the quantum realm? You know, uh, is life more than just, are we just more than steam engines? Now, of course, there are many 
<clears throat> ideas and and and, and uh, well developed theories about the notion of of energy um, uh, transfer, the notion of entropy and, and order and um, uh, far, uh, um, systems far from equilibrium and so on. Does quantum mechanics come in here? Well, just over a decade ago, the science writer Philip Ball wrote, wrote an article in Nature, uh, The Dawn of Quantum Biology, uh, and that really, he, he was highlighting a number of experimental results, many quite speculative, suggesting that, yes, indeed, there is something non-trivial uh, due to quantum mechanics that explains certain phenomena inside living systems. Um when we talk about quantum biology, we are not simply suggesting that if you dig deep down enough down to the level of molecules and atoms, you're going to see quantum behavior, or you're going to see the, the, the ordering of electrons in shells according to the rules of quantum mechanics. Of course that will happen, but that happens in inanimate matter in the same way that it happens inside living matter. So it's not a surprise. Quantum biology is beyond that. Is, is there something non-trivial taking place in, in living systems that is different. Long live quantum coherence, quantum superposition, quantum tunneling, uh, quantum entanglement. And over the past couple of decades, I guess, there've been a number of candidate uh, 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 examples where quantum biology seems maybe manifesting itself. Uh, certainly enzyme action, the, the transfer of electrons and protons inside living cells uh, the, the the building and breaking of of biomolecules by by enzymes seems to have uh, it seems to make use of quantum effects like quantum tunneling to move particles from one part of the cell to the other. Photosynthesis. Well, I've said well established here, but actually that's probably not quite true. There are there is still a debate raging as to whether that first stage in photosynthesis, the delivery of the of the energy, the photon of, of sunlight from the chlorophyll molecule at the surface of a, of a leaf or a bacteria down to the reaction center in the cell, whether that delivery mechanism uses this notion of quantum coherence, the photon following multiple routes simultaneously that are in superposition with each other. Um, there is experimental evidence, the, the chemist, a chemist in, uh, uh, now in Chicago, Greg Engel, uh, uh, proposed this idea some years back uh, because they they carried out various experiments in in uh, spectroscopy to suggest that actually this is uh, this takes place. Magneto reception in birds. This is sort of the the poster child of quantum biology that certain animals, uh, birds, marine mammals, insects uh, have this uh, uh, magneto reception uh, um, ability to sense the, uh, the uh, direction of the Earth's magnetic field, and the, somehow they have a built-in compass that allows them to navigate through the Earth's magnetic field. And one of the few, the, with really the only well-established notion, idea, or theory now of how this compass works relies on uh, ideas in quantum physics, quantum entanglement. Uh, olfaction, again, this is still speculative, but it may rely on quantum tunneling. Mutations in DNA, I'm going to talk about this work in a few minutes. This is our work at, at Surrey, where the proton transfer between nucleotide bases and DNA relies on quantum uh, tunneling. And then there are other more speculative ideas, the connection with cancer, connection with the origin of life, and of course, connection with the nature of consciousness. My, my main concern about those last three um, is not that they're wrong. Uh, you know, we simply don't know yet. These are complex issues and we're still feeling our way, but rather that they very easily lend themselves to being picked up by pseudoscience. Woo woo. Uh, so before you know it. And, and, and I, I'm sure those of you working in, in sort of theories of quantum consciousness will know this very well. You know, immediately there will be people saying, oh, well, of course, quantum mechanics, therefore, must explain telepathy, must explain homeopathy, uh, even astrology, uh, you know, all nonsense, of course. Uh, uh, and so there's that care that we have to take when we're doing proper science to take these things uh, step uh, one step at a time. OK, um, so John Joe, uh, you recognize if you recognize his face, say hi to John Joe uh, at the conference. He and I wrote a book uh, back in 2015, uh, Life on the Edge. I think it's still the only book on, on uh, a, a popular science book on, on quantum biology where we touched upon uh, a lot of these ideas. 
Okay, that's sort of the, the history of quantum biology, the definition of quantum biology. I now want to, this is a bit of fun, talking about the idea of quantum measurement, um, coming at it from perspective of a physicist. There's a bit of maths here, so uh, uh, forgive me. Uh, but but I wanted to tie it in with some of our latest research uh, at Surrey in, in quantum biology. The famous Schrodinger's cat problem. Okay, the idea uh, that uh, the cat in the box trapped with a, a vial of poison, which is triggered by the release of a radioactive particle, which may or may not uh, be released in a given period of time. So during that, a single half-life of that, the radioactive uh, uh, material, there's a 50-50 chance that it, it will or will not have emitted a particle, which of course would then uh, um, release the poison and kill the cat. Uh, and the, the basic explanation, you know, the cat is uh, inside the box and its state becomes entangled with the state of the of the uh, uh, of the the atom, the, the radioactive atom, which is in a superposition. So the cat is therefore both dead and alive at the same time until we open the box. That's the hand wavy popular science. Uh, explanation. But of course, the measurement problem is a very serious and, and, and important idea in quantum mechanics, because the founding fathers didn't really bother with it. Niels Bohr taught, you know, they had developed the, the foundations of quantum mechanics or the mathematical framework, and then said, yeah, but when a measurement takes place, magic happens. There's an irreversible act of amplification when the quantum system interacts with a classical detector and they left it at that it, th these were the postulates the born postulates there are actually three problems with the uh, three um, separate steps in the measurement problem there's the problem of preferred basis you know what is it that gets measured uh, what what's observable uh, and you can't measure two observables at the same time there's the problem that we never see interference you know you open the box so you never see the cat uh, dead and alive at the same time both of those issues have been solved by the study of decoherence theory which i really think should be taught to undergraduate physicists now it's it's a mature area uh, of, of quantum physics for the last half a century and then of course there's this the problem of outcomes which takes us here's where you have to sort of nail your your your, your flag to a mast for a particular interpretation? Is it sort of spontaneous collapse of the wave function theories? Is it um, many worlds interpretation? Is it hidden variables? Is it the Copenhagen view and so on? Um, the problem of preferred basis, let me deal with that first. Um, again, apologies, you can switch off for maybe for a minute if, if you don't like quantum mechanics, the maths. Um, an atom can be put in a superposition of, of uh, eigenstates of a particular um, operator corresponding to a particular observable. Let's say here, this is the spin operator. It corresponds to measuring, say with a magnetic field, what direction a particle like an electron is spinning, up or down. If you set up your detector, like you know, it's a Geiger-Marsden experiment, um, to measure the spin along the Z axis, then, you, 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 you describe your particle's wave function, its quantum state, as a superposition of spin up and spin down. A and B are, are simply amplitudes. The, the squares of those amplitudes gives us the probability of finding the particle were we to measure it in, in uh, spin up or spin down. But before you measure it, it's in this quantum superposition of both at once. The point here is that each eigenstate each of these spin up and spin down, these, uh, or this is what's called Dirac notation with the arrow pointing up, arrow pointing down. These are quantum states. Each of them can be written itself as a superposition of eigenstates of a different uh, operator, a different basis, namely one here that measures the spin in the X axis direction. So the spin up state can be written as a superposition of spin left and spin right. Likewise, with spin down, notice here there's a minus sign, not a plus sign. So, so each state can itself be written as a superposition of states of, of, uh, in a different basis. So we can write the atom's overall wave function in terms of the spin left and spin right. So it's in the superposition of up and down, superposition left and right. Which is it? What, you know, we can't measure its spin along the z-axis 
and along the x-axis at the same time. We have to choose one or the other, and that's because we would violate the uncertainty principle. We can't know both in the same way that you can't know the position of a particle and its momentum at the same time, or the energy of a particle and the moment you measure that energy. <laughs> time and, and energy also have a, an uncertainty uh, relation. And so the point is that we have to choose. We have to set our device, our measuring device up to measure a particular, in a particular, uh, a particular um, observable. We don't need, the point to hear is that we don't need a an, an, uh, measuring device, a Geiger counter or a magnetic field or something like that, some sort of detector uh, with a dial to, to give us information. The environment surrounding a quantum system can itself carry out a measurement. The criterion for what we refer to as a measurement, which sort of ties in with what Niels Bohr used to say, is that those different states of the environment have to be macroscopically distinguishable, right? That, that, that they, they don't overlap in the macroscopic world, like a cat being dead and the cat being alive. Very, very distinguishable states. By the way, um, other physicists very often have changed the Schrodinger's cat dead and alive to Schrodinger's cat um, awake and asleep uh, for, for the benefit of cat lovers. Uh, I simply say this is a thought experiment. No cats were harmed in any experiment in the real world. Okay, so we come back to the cats. The cat's in the box. Um, let's assume the cat is part of the environment inside the box, the same as all, all the molecules of air uh, uh, inside the, and, and everything else inside the box is part of the macroscopic environment. The atom which may or may not decay, we have to describe it as a superposition of both decayed and undecayed at the same time. And its state very quickly becomes quantum entangled with its surroundings. It infects, its superposition infects its surroundings inside the box. And so the full quantum state of everything in the box is now uh, 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 an entangled state of undecayed atom and a live cat, plus decayed atom and dead cat. The cat being macroscopically, have, being in different macroscopically distinguishable states is then able to uh, cause decoherence. This doesn't mean the cat is dead or alive yet. It simply means both states exist, but the state of one and the other no longer exists. This is where interpretation comes in. If the observer opens the box, they will only see a dead cat on a live cat. So what's happened? Well, if you're an advocate of spontaneous collapse models, then essentially the cat has already caused the collapse in, uh, of, of, the, of the state of the atom. It's, the cat has chosen a uh, dead state or a live state. In the many worlds interpretation, which, uh, you know, or probably it's fair to say a growing number of physicists are now uh, coming round to, I'm still in, I'm, I'm uh, agnostic about it. Um, it says that no, both states continue to exist, but Schrodinger opens the box and the universe splits. Uh, in, in one universe, he sees the alive cat and the other universe, he sees the, the dead cat. So it's the observer uh, who becomes there himself entangled with, with the state but we are now in just one branch of the universe. There's no collapse at all. Uh, okay, so I'm just checking the time as well. So moving on to chapter three, how does this idea of measurement play a role inside um, uh, living systems, inside the cell? Uh, and this is work that we've been carrying out over the past few years on the idea of protons quantum tunneling uh, uh, between strands of DNA. This goes back to the wor work of uh, Per Olof Lövdin, Swedish physicist who published a paper in 1963 where he suggested, um, based on a Crick, uh, Watson Crick uh, model of DNA, that the nucleotides, the bases along the strands of the DNA are held together by um, uh, hydrogen bonds. So uh, adenine, thymine held together by a double H bond, uh, guanine and cytosine held by a triple a, uh, H bond. These hydrogen bonds for me, because I'm a, 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 my background's in nuclear physics, a hydrogen atom for me is a proton, okay? I don't care about electrons, I leave them to the chemists. 
This is a proton that's sitting in a, a, a potential well, well, a double potential well between the two nucleotide bases uh, that can hop potentially. This is what Lerfdeen's suggestion was. It can hop from one side to the other. So um, th this, this is a simulation carried out using an, an approach called density functional theory, uh, work we published some years back, showing that these protons, the white balls are the, are the, are the protons, the hydrogen atoms, they can hop from one side to the other. The point is that when they jump to the other side, we end up with the tautomeric form of these bases. If the strands split in the process of replication and the proton is on the wrong side, then that tautomeric form will likely lead to a mutation. C will no longer bond to G, A will no longer bond to T because the proton is in the wrong site. Essentially what's happening is, is that the proton is feeling a potential energy surface, a, a double well. It's sitting in, in one well, which will be deeper than the other, so it's more stable. Um, and it can spontaneously maybe jump right across to the other well, maybe given a kick by the environment, thermally activated, that proton can move across to the other side. But of course, quantum mechanics says that it can also quantum tunnel through to the other side doesn't have to get to the top of the hill. You can kick the ball halfway up the hill and then it sort of disappears and reappears on the other side. Why? Because in the quantum realm, the proton is behaving like a spread out wave, a wave function. There's a certain probability that at any given time, you could find it spontaneously on the other side, even though it didn't have enough energy to get right over the barrier. Physicists and chemists are very familiar with quantum tunneling. It's not magic, it happens all the time. Uh, we're only now discovering that there are certain mechanisms inside in biology where quantum tunneling also plays a role. So the question we wanted to address was, is quantum tunneling uh, important uh, in, in, this, in proton transfer? How important is it uh, in, in biology? Um, paper we published last year, this, this is the work of all, uh, our then uh, PhD student, Louis Slocum, um, carrying out computational chemistry simulations to, to plot the potential energy surface of, the, of hydrogen bonds between GC and AT. And you can see for AT, the proton sits here in this uh, uh, deep well in the right place, the canonical positions, and the energy that you need to get it to the tautomeric state in, involves quite a steep hill. And it's not very stable up here. This is the, it'll, it'll very easily sort of roll back down into the into the uh, deep well. But for GC, there is some stable, shallower well on the other side, suggesting there's a there's a chance that it could spend some fraction of its time in thermal equilibrium. At any given moment, you take a snapshot of of a pair of bases, and you would find the proton on the wrong side. Okay. Um, I, you know what? I'm going to skip this quantum mechanics. So the idea is that we are um, using what's called an open quantum system approach, where we solve a master equation. Essentially, we are taking into account the fact that the system is not in isolation. It's surrounded by an environment that's interacting with it, that's measuring it, and the system in turn is leaking information out into its environment. We want to see the, the influence of the environment on the proton's dynamics. Uh, okay, so having done that open uh, quantum cal um, systems uh, calculation, um, we uh, uh, published a paper um, more recently suggesting that the chance that the proton is in the tautomeric side is in fact very high. One chance in 10,000, that proton will be on, on, in, the, in the tautomeric, uh, 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 in the shallow well. If the, the strands separate and split in the helicase and then go through a process of replication, this would suggest there's a very strong chance that there will be uh, a mutation. And of course, we know that mutations, there are lots of reasons for point uh, uh, mutations in DNA. Uh, this would be just one of them, but we know they don't, they're not that regular. So what's happening? Why is, does quantum tunneling seem to be so important? In fact, we found that if the proton's going to find itself across in, in the tautomeric side, it's, it's about 10,000 times more likely to do so via quantum tunneling than over the barrier classical hopping. So if it's going to get across, 
quantum tunneling is is playing the main the major role. What's interesting is that one can calculate essentially how much quantumness is in the system, how much quantum coherence is in the system by 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 calculating a quantity called the von Neumann entropy, the amount of of of, of disorder. There's a definition of entropy. The von Neumann entropy of the system plotted here against the temperature of the surrounding environment of the bath, okay, up to a uh, thousand Kelvin. It this is at thermal equilibrium, which the proton sort of, as you start it off on one side and let it reach equilibrium, uh, it'll take about one picosecond. We're more interested, of course, in biological uh, uh, temperatures around about 300 Kelvin. And you can see here that the system has far from reached full decoherence. Entropy has, is far from maximum. There's still quantumness going on. The proton can still quantum tunnel in its surrounding environment in DNA, uh, surrounded by water, essentially, in the cellular environment. And quantum tunneling is still taking place. So decoherence is not setting in yet in, in inside the cell. There's still quantum behavior going on. Of course, what happens then once the DNA enters the helicase is that the two strands of DNA will be unzipped. They'll be separated. And the big question here is this proton tunneling, this jumping across from one side to the other, what happens when it starts to separate? Does the potential barrier get so high that it traps the proton on the tautomeric side? Or does something else happen to the energy landscape? Well, we this is the plot I showed earlier. This is the potential uh, energy surface in, for GC. Uh, for double DPT's double proton transfer here, um, for a pair of bases that's sitting in solution this is before it's reached the helicase. But what happens when it starts to unzip and the strands start to separate is not just that the barrier gets higher, but that the tautomeric barrier shape changes. The helicase is essentially carrying out a quantum measurement, but it's also at the same time changing the energy felt by this proton. Essentially, this enzyme asparagine inside the helicase is, is washing out this well, this potential energy well on the tautomeric side. In a sense, what you could say is that the helicase is pouring those protons back down into the deep well. It's reducing the number of tautomeric pro protons on the tautomeric side. So to, 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 to finish, the helicase is what is, is playing the role of Schrodinger. It's opening the box. The cellular environment, um, the, uh, the, is essentially the, uh, you know, the, the, all the molecules of water. That's the cat inside the box. The proton is sitting in, 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 in both locations. In fact, we talk about it as being spread out. So it's, this, the environment is causing decoherence, but not full decoherence. The start, the proton's position is starting to come into focus, but it's still described by a quantum wave function that's spread out over both sides. It's the helicase that is the observer that measures the, the, the proton's position. It picks out the dead cat or the alive cat. It picks out the proton in one place or the other. So the helicase is carrying out a quantum measurement inside the cell, but quantum mechanics is taking place because it's changed the energy it's reduced the frequency dropped the population of of protons on the tautomeric side what we can we think is happening is not just that inside the cell in this example life knows about quantum mechanics rather than life using quantum mechanics to its advantage What's happening is that life knows about quantum mechanics and is trying to prevent it from potentially causing too much damage. We don't want that, that many incidents of, of, of uh, uh, mutations. So life has potentially, speculating here, evolved the ability to mitigate against the worst excesses of uh, a quantum behavior inside the living cell. Okay, I'll just end by thanking my, my, my colleagues and collaborators here. Much of the work was carried out by my grad student, Max Winoken, uh, carrying out some very complex molecular dynamics calculations, umbrella sampling and, and density functional theory. Louis Slocum is now a postdoc working with us and Marco Saki is a computational chemist whose, whose coattails I hang on to to try and understand the chemistry 
uh, coming from a background of physics. Um, and I think with that, I will stop and thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jim. I think we have time for one.